Well, for my next job I'm going to test the speed. Um, I've used one kilohertz tone recorder on another cassette deck, but I don't even know if that's right, so I've uh, marked the tape. Um, and I'm going to use the method of marking the, a certain length of the tape and then timing it, so that's what I think I'll do um, to get the speed right. Um, I've marked it for 20 and 40 seconds, so it's on pause. It's whether I can switch the pause quickly without dropping the cassette deck on the floor means it's in lots of bits. And to flick it quickly to make sure that the front spool doesn't whiz round and uh, therefore uh, make a bit of a mockery of the, uh, the calculation. But I'm just waiting for my clock to come round and I'm going to flick it and do it. Um, Right, here goes. Right, let's see if we go. Right, ready on the 40. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Right. Very difficult to handle that. And the mark is just to the right, I assume. Yes, it's actually come off, but I can I know it's there. Yes, that's not far wrong. I think I'll uh, live with that. That uh, yeah, seems all right. So it's not far wrong. It's slightly to the right, but percentage-wise, it's a very small amount. Got the power supply board off, so I thought I'd just uh, lubricate the uh, recording level control. As you can see, it isn't a slider control. There's a big sort of corkscrew. As I move the control up and down, it's actually turning a conventional pot, which is probably <laughs> probably a lot better quality actually. Uh, you've got long tracks, then have you? But it's an intriguing mechanical way to produce a big long slide control. Right, I'm going to do some capacitor testing. Hopefully you can see the display. It's very difficult to get it at an angle that so doesn't get reflections on, but uh, this one's 1200. Switch it on again. That's 1266, I think it's close enough. Now this one is 1500. Hmm. Well that's not bad, 2000, okay it's a bit high. But the ESR is 0.15 ohm, you know that's a sign of a good capacitor. And this, lastly this one, which I think is a 220. It is, it's come out 242 with an ESR of 0.16 ohms. So, what was the ESR on the 1200? 0.25. That, I, that's pretty good. So, I don't think the smoothing capacitors need changing at all. Just going through some more stuff in the uh, manual, some things that I can test on this cassette deck. Um, one of them is the take up reel tension and that calls for measuring the motor current so I've set up for doing that and I've also had to disable the auto stop so what I'll do is I'll stall that take up reel and in the meantime let's see what the uh, current goes up to there we go at the moment it's about 35 isn't it so if we stall it or what is it about about 11 12 more then well that's okay because it calls for um, something in the region of 8 to 12 milliamps so 
I guess that'll do, won't it? So uh, that's good. That shows that this take-up spool is good. Just looking across the array's head, it says it should be between 50 and 70 kilohertz. And I've got 62, and we've got 23 volts RMS, and it's, it should be at least 15. So the uh, BIOS oscillator looks uh, nice and healthy. I'm just looking at the uh, just looking at the BIOS voltage. Uh, the bias on the head, you can see it's 12.7 volts on that side. And 11.5 on that side, so there is a slight discrepancy there, but it's not large. It's supposed to be possible to check a test point, but I've not had much luck in getting a reading on that point. Turn the sensitivity up. It's only 17 millivolts. Oh, well, it is there. It's a bit noisy. I wouldn't like to say if I take that as being accurate, but yeah, there's a resistor on the bottom end of the uh, head for checking the bias voltage. Um, as they're fairly similar, um, that RMS voltage is given the noise on this. I, I, I just don't think. Let's see if I can stabilise it a bit better. I think what I'd be better off doing is uh, perhaps trying to uh, stabilise that. Right, I'm looking at the earth connection on the head now against an earth connection I believe is very close to the resistor on the head ground side. It's showing 27 millivolts. I've um, averaged this out and I've adjusted the triggering to give low frequency rejection so it's a lot more stable reading. So it's showing 27 on that one. And on this channel, just give it a chance to average out, that's shown 30. That is quite high because the suggested amount is 17 and somewhere between 9.5 and 25. Now, it's entirely possible it's either drifted or it's even entirely possible that somebody has tweaked this to use a different tape type um, as a compromise. But uh, it might be worth turning down um, the higher channel if I can work out which one it is. Um, Now it's a little bit lower than it was. It's a little bit closer to the other one now. Yeah, that's a little bit better. I thought we'd just look at the uh, <coughs> DNL operation now. Um, as I'm going to do some uh, measurements with the oscilloscope just to see a little bit of what's going on with it and uh, do some tests but uh, basically the input from the tape recorder comes in goes through a splitter then it goes through a phase reversal filter that is, has 180 degrees at 10 kilohertz then an attenuator then straight out that still happens even if the DNL is off so that's interesting that the phase is being shifted don't know what that does to the audio but there we go there's a second piece of circuitry which is the DNL itself really there's a high pass filter at 5 kilohertz an amplifier variable attenuator and that appears to consist of two back-to-back -back diodes fed from the audio um, this is um, active when it gets above 7.8 millivolts. Well, it is obviously gradually changing. There's a high pass filter here at 5 kilohertz. And the idea is as the attenuator is open, there is phase opposition with this phase shift circuit here. So basically at the lower level, that's below 7.8 millivolts, some of the signal is allowed through here and is in phase opposition with this signal here and that's how attenuation of the high frequencies is obtained so basically we've got an automatic gain control on the high frequencies above 5 kilohertz so on lower passages of the music or whatever's on the tape the uh, high frequencies are being attenuated but as you get above I think it's minus 38 or something something like that, um, this 
attenuator is fully on so there is no attenuation of the high frequency at all so that's basically how the DNL works and it's separate from the rest of the tape recorder circuit it's on a separate board and uh, basically you could use it with another tape recorder I guess if you wanted to as long as the levels were correct um, the input levels were correct then it would do what it does but uh, we'll have a listen to what it sounds like later in the video or perhaps the next video it depends how much material I've got but um, this switch here is used to turn the DNL off so basically it shorts the uh, signal right out so you're basically getting the signal through here and, and no phase opposition through here so that's how it's switched out of circuit right on to some silligrams I guess next okay so next thing I'm going to do is test the DNL board and as you can see I've got various scope probes and resistors hanging off the uh, DNL board and uh, I'm just now trying to if I can get the there we go. You can see I'm just checking how accurate the divider is. <laughs> Having to use the uh, averaging again because it's a bit noisy. Um, there's a lot of noise on the uh, ground and I believe that's because the uh, scope has a switch mode power supply in. I think that adds the noise. But anyway, it says it calls for a signal of 2.5. Uh, millivolts at 2 kilohertz and I'm going to be changing that frequency and then monitoring what happens to the uh, output voltage just to see if the DNL is working. Okay so this is the output of the DIN socket um, which I assume is what I need to be looking at and we're around 2 millivolts. I'm running 2 kilohertz tone so I'm now going to press some buttons here and uh, move it up to 8 kilohertz. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It says the output should decrease between 1.5 millivolts and 2 millivolts. Well, yeah, that seems about right. That's assuming my test point is correct. Um, I'm assuming from what it's saying it's actually referring to the output socket on the DIN plug so that obviously is um, reducing the output as the frequency increases um, so that appears to be working I just need to try it on the other channel and just see if the results are the same something I forgot to mention is have you noticed how the phase is the phase relationship is changing as we shift the frequency as well that appears to be how the system attenuates it seems to be um, phase related so that's interesting to note okay I've just got my finger on the DNL switch up oh, off on I'm at 8 kilohertz there we go so we can see it's actually doing something and this is the other channel by the way so that's looking good it's looking like things are working so what I've done now is I've turned the input signal up so representing that the audio level is higher and now when we switch up from two three four five six seven eight you can see that the amount of reduction now of the higher frequencies is reduced and as you bring up the level it should not reduce level at all so it's working a little bit like a noise gate I guess. Now let's have a look at the phase relationship between the input signal and the output signal. Um, I'm at 1 kilohertz and you see there's a little bit of a phase shift. 2, 3, 4, 5, six let's open it up so apparently when we get up to 10 kilohertz we should have a shift of 180 degrees well not quite but it's not far out is it um, 
that's the first part of the circuit and we'll have a look at that shortly but uh, that's the DNL off and you can see there's a phase shift just on the remaining part of the circuitry um, even though the DNL is off so where is the where does it become 180 I'm at quite a high frequency now so it could indicate that oh, that's 17 kilohertz um, that could indicate that the filter is off back to 10 yeah that's not 180 is it mm -hmm. okay perhaps I'll try the other channel and see if it's uh, any different but uh, I would hope that small value capacitors don't tend to drift. Just looking at the other channel, um, that's not 180 at 10 kHz either, is it? Uh, well, at least it's consistent with the other channel, isn't it? That's kind of interesting because the uh, manual kind of suggests that 10 kHz it should be. Uh, reversed but uh, well that's interesting never mind anyway I think I've had enough tomfoolery with this now I've tested a lot of it out now I've not I know I haven't been able to do everything but uh, now I think it's time to put it back together and actually listen to it and see what it sounds like well it's time to start gluing things back together now I think um, fortunately it's pretty obvious I'm getting shot where things go because you can see the where the old glue was so I'll get the rubber cement out and uh, have a go with that I've been playing the recorder for some while a little while just doing some tests before I put it back in its case and the motor has got rather noisy so it looks like motor's going to have to come out I can see there's a clamp holding it in that's fine what concerns me is how I get the back off the motor that's going to be a little bit more difficult so uh, that's rather unfortunate you get so far in and then find you've got a motor problem I've got the motor out I've got the motor out now I think the reason I didn't spot it maybe is because I was running it sideways but yeah that's not good does it? it sounds like a distressed bird well some lessons I've learned about this motor is if I try and pull his sleeve off I notice that the pulley goes and hits the top of this case so it looks like I need to remove this pulley but that is very very difficult I guess you can heat it but I'm just rather worried I'm going to break something so I'm going to have to compromise a bit with this and uh, that compromise is using a little bit of penetrating oil I put some down the top bearing something I didn't want to do but I have done it it's a calculated risk is to put some penetrating oil where the power cables enter and so I've sprayed some penetrating oil in there and I'm just running the motor it's not my smartest move but I'm frightened I'm going to destroy this motor taking it apart so I may have to use that as a compromise and just see if it helps quiet the bearing down if not I'm gonna to have to hunt for another motor um, a reversible one uh, for this but let's see what happens well hopefully I've got enough penetrating oil in it just to um, help lubricate the bearings I'm just running it up this way now the way it would in the tape recorder plus the fact I've put penetrating oil in this top section I just hope it doesn't get into the brushes and completely naff the motor but so far it sounds a lot lot better than it did I suspect I shall have to reset the speed now 
possibly, but um, that's unfortunate because the motor never really sounded noisy until I'd given it a bit of use. You know, play through a couple of sides of cassettes. I know that isn't a, a very long time, but it's quite surprising how these things develop. Fingers crossed. I'm just setting up here with um, an external sound card to the tape recorder. And I'm just going to do some tests, I think, and just see what we uh, get. Um, I should be able to make some recordings as well. Uh, sample the output and uh, we'll see what the DNL sounds like as well. So that's the next uh, uh, thing I should be doing. <laughs> 